Here we go. Hi, good evening. It's um, Monday night. By the time you see it, it'll be Thursday night, hopefully. Uh, welcome to the second part of this, I guess, six-part lecture series. Hope I can pack it all into six parts. And the title of the series, of course, is uh, Fundamental Disagreement. The Maimonidean Controversy of the Middle Ages. This is what I'm doing this year for the three weeks uh, lecture series as I do every uh, summer. I try to um, different sorts of, I guess, tragedies, controversies, things like that in Jewish history. Uh, so this year we're doing the Maimonidean Controversies of the uh, Middle Ages. Tonight is the second of the lectures, as you can see. It's uh, called uh, uh, Maimonides the Great Popularizer, or Mr. M Mr. Middlebrow, as I will try to uh, make the case for. <laughs> Tonight's um, talk is being sponsored by uh, the Berlins, from Sherry Berlins, you can see over here. In memory of uh, Mark Messinger, we all remember so fondly. I mean, Mark Messing's all to whom we owe so much. That's from Hermann Sherry Berlin. I want to thank you, Hudalay, my son, for sitting here in Pashkin and uh, doing the, uh, the filming. Hopefully, by the winter, we won't have to do this anymore. And uh, I want to thank Howard Elbaum for putting together the PowerPoint. And now, without any further ado, as we always have a lot of material to cover, let's get down to work. So tonight, as I said before, the title is Maimonides, the great popularizer. Here we go. The Maimonidean controversies obviously revolve around Maimonides. Or Moshe ben Maimon. Maimonides is Greek for ben Maimon. Moshe ben Maimon. Why? How come his opinions caused all the controversies? And how come other people's opinions didn't? I mean, you don't have a Ralbog controversy. Take it from me. The Ralbog said a lot more things, uh, things that are more controversial than the Rambo. Uh, it's a good question. Obviously, there must be something in the personality of the Rambam Maimonides, in his persona, perhaps I should say, that generated all this. So who was Moshe ben Maimon? Well, he was born in Spain, um, as we see in the next slide, in a Muslim Spain, in 1138, some say 1135, I mean, I'll go with 1138. Uh, and Spain, as I think many know, was the leading Jewish community here, as you see on the Three maps it is uh, Muslim Spain. So in the upper left-hand side, you see what they call the Umayyad Caliphate. That's at the beginning when the Arabs conquered, as you can see, over 90% of the Iberian Peninsula. Although if you see closely, they allowed a small area they couldn't conquer at the top, and that area metastasized. and eventually grew bigger and bigger and wiped out the Muslims. By another 100 years, 200 years, you see the other map. So the Christian part is bigger. But the Muslim part is still pretty big. You see, it's called the Caliphate of Cordoba. It's still pretty big. And the third map at the bottom is at the time of the Rambo, when the Muslims had clearly lost half and more than half of Spain. Uh, you can see, because the Almohads and so forth, uh, the Muslims were uh, perplexed why they were losing. And one group came up with the idea that they're not sufficiently from, from the Islamic perspective, and they should become more fanatically uh, religious. So when the Rambam was born in Spain, in 1138, so Spain was the largest Jewish community in the world. No question about it. The Jewish communities of Spain, in aggregate, were much larger than the Jewish communities, let's say, for example, in Ashkenaz or Italy, as a joke, or many other places. So um, Spain was important. And qualitatively also, Spain was the leading community. First of all, in terms of what I would call Haskalah, in Spain, you had the great poets, uh, grammarians, philosophers, Chumash guys, Nach guys, Tiktok guys. You know what I mean? Now, when I say Haskola, I'm talking about over here, not in a non from sense, but a sense of having a wider definition of Jewish culture than just Gomorrah, Gomorrah, Gomorrah. So Spain was a place where it happened. It didn't happen anywhere else. That's where you have your poets, your thinkers, your historians, and so forth. Um... And that's the community into which Maimonides is born. But I want to point out, Spain was also a leading place for Gamar Gamar Gamar. Maybe the greatest. You know, that's a nice debate we could have. Who's more chashev in learning? Ashkenaz or Sfarad? And let's say, for example, the 10 hundreds or the 11 hundreds. <laughs> you have some pretty heavy hitters, big Rishonim, as we call them at both places. So even in the narrow area of Gamar Gamar Gamar, Spain was a foremost or among the foremost places, and the Rambam is going to be an heir to that also. 
So he's born into a community, like we say today, born in 1938, just for the Holocaust. He born into a community which had a lot of Jews. Um, it included a lot of dumbbell, dumbbell Jews, no question about that. But also a lot of people who were not dumbbells. And you had a lot of Jews who were educated, as I would say, widely in Jewish culture. And you also have a lot of people who were Gamar, Gamar, Gamar guys, right? So, um, that's just interesting. Now, in Spain, unlike elsewhere, the Gemara guys um, included people uh, who were not just Gemara, Gemara, Gemara. They were heavily into... Listen closely to what I'm saying. This is important. This is who the Rambam will be. They're very heavy in Gemara. So they will memorize and all that stuff. But it's Gemara Plus, you see? I don't want to use the word term, but you get the idea when I say that. And you did have this in Spain. So there are people who were very heavily learned in Torah sources, but also had secular education, sometimes impressive ones. This you only had in Spain. You don't have this anywhere else. Now, um, the family of the Rambam was one of those types. They were Gemara, but they weren't Gemara, Gemara, Gemara. They were Gemara, and heavy. His father, Maimon, for example, was a Dayan. And his father before him was a Dayan. If I'm not mistaken, eight generations were Dayan. So you might see he's a rabbi, he's not a rabbi, he's not a rabbi, and I mean a rabbi who Paskin Shilas does get in, handles the kashras and so forth. So he comes from a family with a very long halachic tradition and so forth. But at the same time, his father was an MD, and um, he knew math and science, and things like that as well. I mean, in a real way. So, I repeat. It's a lot of Gemara. I don't want to be misunderstood on this. Um, they're very serious, and Gemara comes first. But the other stuff does come second, and if you can pull it off, they're very classy. They're very classy. Today, you say like this, the guy's like a heart surgeon, and he also does the Dafyomi every day, and he actually knows what he's talking about. I mean, not the Dafyomi from our school Gemara, you know, from the real thing. Now, I said Gemara plus. That could mean Gemara plus Haskalov. So you might be Somebody knows Gemara very well. But you're also into poetry, for example, or grammar, or history, or philosophy, that kind of stuff. Liberal arts, shall we say? Jewish? It's going to be Haskalab. I mean, Shmuel Hanogid comes to mind. Uh, Yudal Levi comes to mind, perhaps. Or it could be not Gemara plus Haskalab, but Gemara plus real secular studies. Um, that was the case with the family of the Rambam and the Rambam himself. And his case... It would be Gemara plus math and science. Because that was his interest. Not history, not poetry. The Rambam group was a person who was in love with math and science and everything associated with that. And he had no time for what we call today the liberal arts and poetry or, or, or that sort of business. Right? Because after all, uh, poetry, philosophy, fiction, they're not true. Uh, I shouldn't say it about philosophy. But poetry, history, um, art... That sort of, they're, 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 they're aesthetic. They're not true. Math and science are true. And he was drawn by his personality to what he was convinced is actually physically and objectively true. That's a core element of the Ramos' personality. You understand what I'm saying? A person can say like this, I like great fiction. I like War and Peace. I don't know, you know, something like that. Gone with the Wind, you name it. Uh, the person knows it's not true. Nevertheless, it's evocative. It's good literature. Not the Rambam. <laughs> right? Not the Rambam. He's interested in that which is true and verifiable. His father, Maimon, was probably that type. The Rambam's father went to the Volusion of Spain, which is in the town of Lucina, not far away from Cordoba at all. So it's like, you know, Lakewood outside of New York, shall we say? Cordoba would be New York, Lucina would be Lakewood. Um, this was the yeshiva that was founded by Shmuel Anugid. And among the Rosh yeshivas was uh, the Rif, and then the Rimigash. And the father, these are famous names, and Ramam's father learned as he's seen yeshivas by the Rimigash, and so he came definitely from yeshiva background, but on the other hand, he had an MD, right? And he was a math and science person. So this is the legacy of the family of Maimonides. One more thing, uh, Ramayman was an MD, but he's also a professional guy in, you get it? Came from a long line of those. And so, do not be surprised, the young Maimonides, it's growing up in a home where Gemara is emphasized, but it's Gemara in the sense of Asuki Shmaitz Alibi Hilchos, as they say, finding what the final ruling is. 
Not like, you know, this guy says it's kosher, this guy's a trave, this one said this, what about the sheet of so and so? They're dying on it. People come in, it's trave, it's kosher, the Arab is up, the Arab is kosher, the Arab is not kosher. You know what I'm saying? Boom, boom, boom. Okay, halachic. And you learn good morning to know what the din is, not to know for the pilpul and the lumbus. That's the family of Maimonides. Uh, and this is an important component of his, of his personality. The Ramba will emerge as very learned. He's one of the great Mishanim, obviously. You don't need to tell you that. And know the Gemara thoroughly, but always with the bent of to finding what's the din, the, the clarkite, to get a clear conclusion was the ruling in uh, this particular case. It's funny, because as we all know, the Sefer the Ram, the Mishnah Torah, has become the headquarters of all the pil- br- brisk, the pilpul, the lumdus, and all the rest of it. Extreme speculative reasoning. One thinks of Chaim, Br- Chaim Brisker, or Samea, Shara Melech, Merkev Mishnah, and all that. Of course, that's true, but if my mom was alive, he said, no, 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 don't go that way. Tell me what the din is. Okay? Uh, now, this classy phenomenon, because he grows up being very well educated in this and growing up well educated in that, I'm sure had to uh, uh, have make have an awareness of being intellectually and morally superior to his fellow Jews, as only great scholars can be. <laughs> it's a very yeshivish type of thing. Uh, but it inspired in him not a smugness, not a disgusting smugness, but in Maimonides. It inspires a sense of noblesse oblige. The public out there a bunch of dummies. I shouldn't go around making fun of them. That's not the point. The point is how to raise them. And if I can raise them to this level, raise them as much as I possibly can. That will be the, the goal of my life, which is a very noble goal, right? As we call it in English, public enlightenment, right? He's devoting his uh, attend, uh, uh, what's the right word, endeavors to promote as much as possible the Jewish people and their enlightenment, okay? So keep that in mind. Now, biographically, the Rambam, well, as I say, he's born in 1138. His mother died in childbirth, by the way. Uh, so Stigma Freud figured that out. But as far as we know, it happened. I mean, his father remarried, had ch- children. He had a happy life until he was 10 years old. And then things became more complicated. So I don't want to spend the whole tonight, as I easily could, giving a detailed biography of my mind, because that's not the point. I want to share only those parts that will be relevant to my broader theme, I hope I'm successful. So very briefly, here's the wanderings of Maimonides and his family, from his birth to his bar mitzvah, actually until the age of 10, my mistake. He lived in the good times in Cordoba when it was under the tolerant Islam. So there was like, perfect, okay? He could study the Torah stuff, he could study the secular stuff. Then from 10 to 22, that's a long time, uh, so he was 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and so forth, he and his family moved from place to place in Muslim Spain. So the uh, Almohads took over. That's an Arabic group. Uh, impressive one that was uh, very religiously fanatical. And anyway, the key point that's negated to us is, unlike most uh, Muslims and unlike the classical teachings of Islam, uh, the Almohads said that the Jews are not allowed to practice Judaism. Usually the way Islam was always interpreted by the Muslims was, as long as the Jews are not uppity and they pay a lot of taxes and things like this, they can be left to practice their religion. That's the famous Demi business, right? So as long as you understand that you're you're like a black guy in South Carolina in 1920, you know, if you know your place and you keep your mouth shut and you know do the right thing, uh, then you can go and practice your own religion. But now things change radically. This new group came over. Asr prohibited Judaism. They said anybody stays Jewish who remains Jewish will get killed. It's either leave the country or convert to Islam or die. Okay? And uh, Drum and his family, his father didn't want to do any of those. They didn't want to leave the country at that time. They didn't want to die and they didn't want to convert. And so what they tried to do was move from place to place, hoping, excuse me, keep a low profile and hoping the persecution wouldn't be so bad over there. It didn't work. Right? And at the age of 22, it got so hot that they moved to Morocco, which is across the uh, Straits of Gibraltar, obviously, right? And there, obviously, you had to live as a Morano. So somewhere along the line, nobody wants to say it, but it's pretty clear to me, anyway, the whole family converted to Islam because they had no choice. Now, they didn't mean it, of course, and a ton of Jews didn't mean it. 
And there's a whole discussion of this with Ram Marodi Gares I don't want to go into it. But I only share this with you so that you'll understand that here's somebody who's a teenager from the age of 10 and going through all his teens. He does not go to any yeshiva, does not go to any day school, uh, but he learns he learns behind closed doors with his father, or maybe there were some other secret members of the community, like secret yeshivas, they didn't have yeshivas, you know, secret chavrusas, or something like this, and you learn through shots. It's, it's crazy. But on the street, you have to be a Muslim, you have to say, I believe in, in, in Muhammad and all that stuff. You have to go to the mosque. Um, you have to observe, you know, the basic rules of Islam. Uh, but there's no inquisition, so they don't look, they simply didn't look what you do behind closed doors. That made it possible to have a double life. And as far as I know from all the evidence, uh, that's what the Ramadan's family did. Okay? Uh, remember, he doesn't hold it, Islam as a vote is Arab. So therefore, converting, in the sense of just saying you believe in it, it's not identical to Avodah Zarah. So it's not one of the things you have to give up your life for. It's not identical to Avodah Zarah. That's the sheet of the Ramadan. Others disagreed, but I'm just saying um, what happened in his case. And therefore, we have a most unusual Rishon. I don't think of any other Rishon like that. Rashi grew up in a regular Jewish background. Tosis grew up in a regular Jewish background. The Rosh, the Rashba, the Ritva, the Ramban, it's all that grew up in a regular Jewish background. Maimonides did not grow up in a regular Jewish background. You simply have to get over that. And it just makes his achievement all the more remarkable because whatever he did, it was like Anne Frank learning Shas. That's what it is, right? Well, not quite. Anne Frank had to hide the very fact that she's there. These guys are on the street. And uh, the Ramban, therefore, um, goes to Islamic schools, you have to, he learns all the Muslim stuff, he doesn't respect it, but he holds all the Muslim stuff, and he's drawn from an early age um, to math and science, and he learns math and science with Muslims, at that time the, the Muslims were, were more on the secular studies and scientific stuff, and he refers, and I'll show you a little later if I have time, to teachers and fellow students with whom he learned astronomy, mathematics, and all this kind of stuff, in Spain and Morocco. He was also drawn to medicine. Uh, again, in some of his writings, he talks about the fact that he uh, studied medicine as one did in the old days, not to go into four years medical school, but hooking up with uh, MDs and learning, like we would say today, the way lawyers used to work, used to learn, uh, what's the right word? Uh, reading law, you know, like Abraham Lincoln. So they would, you know, get uh, shimush, and they would read the books, of course, and from the physical case with the doctors, they would learn the medicine. And that's the kind of medical education he got in Morocco, but he wasn't a practicing doctor. Um, and he has to keep a low profile. Right? Now, I don't know how he did that, because there was a fairly large community of Moranos, like himself. And um, he does try to propagate Judaism within the fold, but that's very dangerous. And it got so dangerous that, um, whereas... In his t teens and 20s, uh, he was able to learn discreetly with his father. After a while, it got too hot to do that. <clears throat> now, I want to point out something here. It's very important. The Rambam was into math and science, as I said before. He was into medicine. That's all true. He also, it turns out, he was into philosophy and theology. But it's just something that turned him on. That's who he is. If you don't know about the Rambam, you don't know anything. It has to be a subject of interest in him. What do I mean by philosophy and theology? There are all kinds of schools of philosophy in the Middle Ages. There are too many to go into. And this Arabic school and that Arabic school. And the Rambam himself always like read these books. He was a voracious reader of this kind of stuff. Geisha stuff. Uh, in addition to the Torah stuff, uh, question, now this is science of a thousand years ago. So it's interested not only in questions of hard sciences as we would describe them today, but also questions of metaphysics, of God, of heaven, and not that kind of business. And there are a lot of Islamic theologians who argue with each other, as happens in any science. And the Ramah's interest in all these points of view. So to just give you an example I'm talking about, without getting too bogged down in this, what kind of proof do you have for the existence of God? Or that the world was created out of nothing? Well, this Muslim guy says you have this proof, and the other guy slugs it up. And that Muslim philosopher says you have that proof. And the Ramah would come from a school of thought, the false of all, in which we say, these arguments to the other guys are lousy uh, because they can be refuted or they're not well-grounded and so on and so forth. Now, he also believes in God, but he holds that the other guy's arguments are what we call grade B. You understand? Community college. <laughs> right? 
Uh, so this is just simply philosophy and theology, especially in the area of, of definition of God and universe, just is a, a subject that turns him on. And he read this stuff with Goyim, okay? Uh, mainly in his years in uh, teens and, and in um, his early 20s. Now, as you see in the map, no, let's go back. No, 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 next one. Right there. As you see over here, um, from the ages of 22 to 27, they tried to live this life that I just described you. That's when he's learning math, science, theology, philosophy, Islamic philosophy. And, um, but it's not, Islamic philosophy doesn't mean the philosophy of Islam. It's the Islamic thinkers about the great metaphysical questions that are out there for everybody. And um, that's Murano. After a while, it got too hard. People started to say, is he really Jewish? He started to feel the heat. And so the family ran away. And in the age of 27, when he was 27 years old, they tried to make Aliyah. They ran away from Morocco, went on a ship, and they went to Israel. It's the time of the Crusades. But like many people, the Aliyah didn't work. They tried to make it work in Akko. They visited Yerushalayim. But the long and the short of it is it didn't work. And so at the age of 28 years old, having wandered from pillar to post, they finally settled in Egypt, and that's where the Rambam remained for the rest of his life. From the age of 28 to 66, which means for um, 38 years, right? Almost 40 years of his life, he'll be living in Egypt, right? So the first part of his life, up to the age of 28, was certainly not in Egypt. And the rest of it was in Egypt. That's the basic uh, biographical facts you need to know. Now, as I said before, let's go to the next one. Here's a quote from the Morning of the book that the Rambam wrote. Just Derek Agav, he's throwing in something. Most recently, some Andalusian scholars, Andalusia is Spain, concluded from certain principles laid down by Ptolemy that Venus and Mercury were above the sun. In other words, he's talking about an astronomy question of the Middle Ages. Ibn Aflach of Seville, with whose son I was acquainted, okay, has written a famous book on the subject. So in other words, the was friends, acquainted, with the son of a famous astronomer. In other words, he used to talk on learning and astronomy with this particular Arab guy. Also, the excellent philosopher Abu Bekr ibn al Sa'id, one of whose pupils was my fellow student. See that? So, if you read through the Ramah's writing, he will reference from here and there, time to time, his experiences not as a Jew, right? But as a Muslim, studying neutral subjects with famous Arab scientists. He has treated the subject and offered proofs which he have copied of the improbability of Venus and Mercury being above the sun. No, it's like I say again. Now it's astronomy. Astronomy is neutral. It's not Jewish. It's not Christian. It's not Muslim. He was interested in mass and science. That's who he was. Now, um, there were different schools of philosophers out there, and uh, a lot of different Islamic schools. I repeat, when I say Islamic, I'm not referring to their position about Muhammad or something like that. But they were Muslims, sometimes Christians, by the way, who wrote in Arabic, and they're talking about. Metaphysics, physics, science in general. Let's go to the next one. So, the Jews who lived in the Middle Ages were able to read Arabic. And they did, the intelligent ones. And what did they read? They didn't read things about the Quran. That's not interesting. Though. But you could read um, secular studies, which are neutral. And as you see over here, here's a list I just put together of famous Jewish philosophers. And the Goyesha, schools of thought with which they were engaged. You have Shlomo Ibn Gavirol, the famous poet, uh, writes the Makar Chaim. He was into Neoplatonism, which is the famous Shita. The Chobos al is also Neoplatonic. Uh, from Jew. But the ideas he talks about, and many of the arguments that he advances, you'll find already in earlier Neoplatonic material. The Ibn Ezra was into something called the Brethren of Purity, which was a school of thought among the Arabs. Uh, Huda Levi was into Al-Ghazali. He said, I know, you know, these are famous names from yesteryear. Uh, the Rasad, the Rasad Yigun was into the classic Kalam, the Mutazilites and the uh, Ashiria, the, the regular uh, people who try to reconcile successfully religion and science. And the Rambam was into something called Falsafa, which is an Arab corruption of philosophy, but it's a certain Shita, which is more Aristotelian, or at least, I don't want to get too technical in this, at least they thought that's what Aristotle was saying. It's not exactly what Aristotle meant. 
it's the translations of the Aristotle stuff that came out in the eight hundreds. But whatever it is, that's what Rambam was into. So he had his opinions, and he was influenced and convinced by the type of argumentation of one particular set of Arab schools of, of thought. This has nothing to do with the fact that he's also plugged away at the Gemara and the Allah and that sort of thing in other hours of the day. He was highly self-disciplined. He's the type of guy who you don't need a mashkiach. You know, he can set himself a daily schedule and adhere to it. You know, from 7 to 8 is Gemara. From 8 to 9 is math. From 9 to 11 is Allah. From 11 to 11.15 is grammar. From 11.15 to 12 o'clock, I don't know, astronomy. You know, that kind of thing, okay? That's who he was. Now, um, here we come to what I ended the previous lecture on. The Jews in the Middle Ages, as we saw, lived in one of two zones, the Christians and the Muslims. Half the world was run by the Muslims, and the other part, Christianity. Okay? The Jews uh, could not really be affected by Christian teachings and thinkings in the Middle Ages, because the Jews, Christianity was plain and partial about his art. First of all, they have a trinity, and second of all, they have statues and idols. And I know the Christians will argue out of it, and I respect that, but Jews in the Middle Ages didn't respect it. They said, it's baloney, you believe in three gods. And you believe in idols. Okay? So, you're not going to find the Jews, certainly not consciously, being aware of what the Christians are writing in Latin and being affected by it. But in the Islamic world, it was a different story. Right? Things are more complex. In this area, which is the Muslim Empire, the Caliphate, which is big, that's where Rove of Claudius Rowe lived. I repeat, the majority of Jewish people are located in these areas. Okay? Now, they could read the books that are written in Arabic. The Jews were not impressed with the essence of Islam. They didn't believe in Muhammad or anything like that. But although the Jews were not Islamized, I've often made the point that the Jews were Arabized, at least to some degree. And so the Caliphate, this empire over here, did develop a secular culture when they discovered the Greek writings from the previous time when the Arabs conquered it. And so one of the famous things we talk about, the golden age of Arab civilization, precisely refers to the period when the Arabs who ruled this empire uh, were Muslims, um, in addition to having the religious Islamic stuff, which they, of course, had. They had mosques and Islamic religious stuff galore. But they also developed a culture which cultivated things like math and science, which are religiously neutral, and other secular subjects as well. Okay? So Jews who lived in this zone, in this map that you're looking at, could, if they wished, consume the secular Arab culture, especially, as they say before, in subjects that are religiously neutral. Now, math is math, and the hard sciences are what they are. So they're neutral. Would you agree with that? There's nothing religious about math, I mean, the geometry, the whole nine yards, right? But, as we've seen, in the Greek, I talked in the last lecture, in the Greek scientific system, if you want to call it scientific, metaphysics was a science. It was a science of the divine. A science of the spiritual world. You understand? You notice, they spoke with scientific certainty, argumentation, about what happens in heaven and hell, or how you define those terms. Right? Uh, it was a science of the spiritual reality as well. Now the problem was as follows. Back in the Greek times, Aristotle and people like him did not have a revealed religion to contend with. They just had the Greek gods, and the Greek pagan gods were just wrong, get over it. So, if you would ask Aristotle, what's shot with Mount Olympus and Zeus and all that, he said those are nice stories, uh, they're fables. Uh, they may tell you important Muslim lessons or whatever, you know, the Trojan horse, whatever. You know, Hercules running off with this one and that one. Apollo, all the stories that we know from the Greek mythology is interesting, but it's not true. <laughs> right? Aristotle said it's not true. God, by definition, can't have a body and can't have limitations and so forth and so on. So get over it. Now, Aristotle was not persecuted for this, okay? Uh, in Aristotle's day and afterwards in the Greco-Roman world, the philosophical skepticism was not persecuted. Let's go to the next one. Unless the philosophers stepped over the line and they started spreading this among the youth and corrupting a religion. So Socrates was accused of this in his famous painting, What's the Cup That He's About to Take? Right? Socrates is the guy with the, without the undershirt. So what's he about? It's a hemlock, right? You know, Socrates was mighty. So the Yenachanamah corrupted the youth. 
I told him the truth. And if that gets me high means, so be it. So that was exceptional. Usually philosophers and politics didn't mix, and philosophers were able to develop what you and I today, I think, would call atheistic philosophy, at least by the Judeo-Christian idea, is atheistic philosophy. Believe me, the Greeks used the word God and gods and all that sort of thing. But as far as Boreolum and that sort of thing goes, that's not what they mean. Okay? Now, in the Middle Ages, things got much more complicated, much more dangerous. Both Christianity and Islam are totalizing religions, and they insisted that their religions, their revelations, because whether you're Jewish, Christian, or Muslim, you claim God spoke to you in some fashion or another. If you're Jewish, it's Moshe Rabbeinu. If you're Arab, it's a Mohammed. If you're Christian, uh, it gets even better than that, you know? God incarnated, as it were, right? So they insisted that their revelations were true. Any challenge to reveal truth, therefore, was a capital offense. So if somebody's going to philosophize and say, like Aristotle, you know, really, there's no God. The story you have in the Bible about Moses is a myth, or Muhammad is a myth, or something like that, I'll kill you. <laughs> right? it's, it's, it's a different world at that time. But the philo philosophical problems remained. Let's confine our attention, for example, to Islam, which was the biggie. In Islam, in the economy, there's no trinity, and Allah is not described physically. I mean, he has a hand or something, yeah. But generally speaking, it's, it's not physical. I mean, there's no actual incarnation of the divine in Islam, as there is in Christianity, correct? Jesus is supposed to be God incarnate. You don't have anything like that. The Muslim will be horrified by that the way the Jews are. Right? Um, but on the other hand, Allah has emotions of all kinds in the Quran. He gets angry, he likes it, this, that, and the other takes revenge, you know. And there's a basic fundamental philosophical problem with emotions. Uh, God, by definition, should not be able to have any emotions because uh, he's showing the shlemus. Emotions always mean that there's a, a, a lack somewhere. Uh, to put it in the simplest possible terms, this is what I usually explain if I haven't done it before. Let's say I never met you. I'm going to meet you today, on Monday. And you're a eternal one. Make a nice impression of me. So, what does that mean? You never were part of my life until now. Now you've become a part of my life. You've added to it. Since you did it in the way that I like, I respond with the emotion called, I like you. Right? Because you supply something positive in my existence. Now I'll give you another example. Let's say I met you today for the first time, and you're a turn off. So you never were part of my life, and now you are. Now you're part of my history. But you were a turn off. So I call it dislike. I dislike you. In other words, you added something to my life, but it was adding adding on something that was not good. So in both cases, I was not shawling until I met you. I won't even be shawling then, because then I'm going to have my next experience. And next experience. So life is like a running movie. You don't know what's going to happen next. And I respond to all those new things, new, new uh, impressions, new acquaintances, new happenings. They're happening all the time with what we call emotions. By definition, God is above all that doesn't have the emotion, he's already shlamous. If God's not shalim, what is he missing? If God's not whole and complete, what's he missing? What he's missing is another God. If that's the case, you have two gods. Let's say, for example, God has everything except, um, I don't know, um, anger. So there are two gods out there then. There's God and then there's anger. Do you see that? Because if he doesn't have it, and this is applying to it, then there's two gods. And yet... Judaism, Christian, and Islam all insist there's only one. So that's not so heavy an argument I just said. I think you can understand that. And what does a philosopher who's a Muslim say with the fact that Allah and the Quran has all these emotions? Uh, secondly, heaven and hell in the Quran are described with a great deal of physicality. Thanks to the uh, terrorists, we all know you get 70 versions. Uh, really? I mean, really, really? Okay? It makes no sense. Is a physical. Heaven? You get it? And if it's not a physical heaven, what are you talking about girls for? Now, starting around the year 800 or so, because the Muslims took over, roughly speaking, 630, 650, so about 150 years later, approximately, some Muslim thinkers started to think gingerly to try to analyze the Quran philosophically. Not to challenge its authenticity, God forbid, 
but to read the Quran philosophically. And therefore, this produced all the Mutazilites, they call them. And uh, this produced all kinds of controversies. Because the firm Muslims said like this just like Jews sometimes say the Torah is eternal, so the moms say the Torah is eternal. Uh, really? Is etern- the Quran is eternal. Really? You literally mean eternal? It's as old as God? It's as old as God? So then there are two gods. There's God and then there's the Torah. Or there's Islam, it's God and then there's the Quran. You hear the problem? So it sounds very firm to say it's, 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 it's eternal. It's always been. But it's a problem if you define God as that which created everything. So this is a problem that the Jews didn't give any thought to, but the Muslims did. And they always started to say, to say like this. Even though it says the Quran is a throne, it's not true. God pre-existed, you know, and he created it. Now, um, the thing is, they were from Muslims, but they insisted on reading their holy books in a certain philosophical way, the details of which I will not go into here. Suffice it to say that many other Muslim religious thinkers disagreed with these Mutazilites on various grounds. This is the complicated field of Islamic religious philosophy, which we have seen fascinated the Rambam, who all of his life was interested in these questions, obviously in an appropriationist manner. You can truly say, um, Zark is a klipa bachal kapri. He threw away the, uh, the peel. He was interested in the fruit. The Rambam's not interested in the Mohammed stuff, and that kind of stuff, but he's interested, like I just said before, in the question, can something be as old as God? Now, in Arab history, some of the caliphs, the rulers, became devotees of the Mutazil and Hashkafa, and they used their political power to shove it down the throats of their subjects. This is a famous and fascinating episode in Arabic history. But some of the caliphs forced the officials and others to say they agree with this, otherwise they get killed. Not surprisingly, this led to a counter-reaction in the Abbasid Empire, in the Arabic Empire, which resulted in a firmer, more orthodox sort of theologizing. They I'm not going to go into detail on this. The entire intellectual phenomenon which seeks to, which seeks arguments, shall we say, to confirm religion. I'm talking about intellectual arguments. It seeks intellectual arguments to fir- confirm religion, to prove the truth of it. Uh, by the way, you see this now. Uh, don't they have speakers coming to school from, uh, what's it called, the, the birthright, the arachim, this and the other, to prove the Torah, to prove this, to prove that. They're very popular. This was called, especially by Maimonides, called Kalam. Kalam means Arab uh, philosophizing, but it's the philosophizing the way I just said. You're trying to bring proofs, like a speaker from the, is it birthright? Not birthright. What do I think of? Um, when you have these speakers come to school. Asia Torah, you know, things like that. You know? And you, what you're trying to see is like this. The Torah says this, but I can prove it from this argument and that argument. So that was the Kalam. It's from philosophy. And you'd be interesting to see that this farfrumta philosophy was a turn-off to the Rambam because he felt it was forced, prejudiced, not really interested in truth, but rather in scoring points for your team. In other words, the philosophical arguments for the existence of God, the running of the world by God, were not good arguments, just from ones. So it's funny. The Rambam is as from as they come, as we shall see. He's a product of the 12th century. But... Uh, heuristically, epistemologically, he says they're arguing uh, just like a, a sophisticated thinker from would read one of these books he finds in shops. He said, I can prove everything in turn. He said, Oh my god, what well, the argument series are. Doesn't mean he doesn't agree with the conclusion, he doesn't like the argumentation. That's who the Rambo was. So, to use broad terms, my mom, these despised theology was in favor of philosophy. Theology means you're just looking to score points. Like a firm scientist today who's turned off by a speaker who claims he can prove the Torah, but his arguments are in the end unscientific and would never get traction in the university world. Now, on the other hand, there did emerge some Arab thinkers, and that's the next slide, who thought in more intellectually rigorous terms. Al-Farabi, Averroes, the Rambam will be a big fan of Al-Farabi on the left, you know, who I think was Iranian and one of the big uh, uh, medieval philosophical thinkers. And Abra Oseba Russia was a contemporary of Maimonides. I don't know if they ever met or not, it's a discussion. Now, these were people were regarded, especially by the Rambam and others, they're not theologians, they're philosophers. They're not interested in Shvacha arguments. They're interested in actual Mamish, solid arguments. Solid arguments judged by the standards of the 12th century, of course. Now, the Rambam 
And this is just the interesting part. He read all these books, all these pamphlets. He was into this. The philosophers, the theologians. And he formed his own opinions. Thus he made himself an expert in this subject by reading everything and coming up using his own mind, you know, to, to form his own opinions. So, the only difference between him and me is I always say, this is my opinion. Ram said, this is the truth. <laughs> right. Because he worked it out. Right? And, he's, and, and he was a great man. These kinds of books and arguments in Arabic flourished in these centuries. This kind of theological, philosophical literature with debates about the definition of God, reward and punishment, creation ex nihilo, you know, yesh mi'ayim, divine attributes, God's unique oneness and perfection, because, you know, it's, see, God is one, but you don't mean one, because one could be two halves, you see? Things like that. And chodvin yochi ki you know, that kind of thing. Uh, all that type of stuff, the young Maimonides ate it up. He read voraciously all the opposing writers and schools of thought, all the speculations, the arguments, the flaws in the arguments, the logic, the logical errors, all that boring stuff, he loved it. <laughs> and true egghead, he couldn't get enough of this literature. And it did take time away from his Lima Torah. Something he regretted in retrospect in his old age. We had a fascinating uh, correspondence with a bunch of from people. We have from, he's in Luniel. Take a look at this. This is remarkable. That's poetic. They ran to these I would call today yeshiva rabbis in France. Alpha Pisha Batam no Tsarti Babetan Atari Datani. He's using the language of this week's Haftorah. The prophet Yermiol says, I didn't want to be a prophet, but God says, Batarim Tsarch Babetan Yedaitika. I knew you as a prophet when you were in your mother's belly, when you were born. This is this is your destiny. So my destiny, Batarim no Tsarti before I was born, Babetan Atora Datani. The Torah knew me in my stomach. You know? And the Torah was magdish me, married me before I emerged from the belly. Well, and I, I was had the mission in life like Jeremiah was a prophet. I was given the mission in life to be Marbis Torah. It's remarkable. It's the the love of my youth. This is my girlfriend and love since I'm a child. Then I was nuts over her since I was a bachar. So the Torah, the Gemara, that was my thing. Fiaf gamzu, but it is true, noshim nachrias naso tzoros. I did marry concubines. Right? But I did marry sheikhs. Now this is not literal. He's using figurative language. I did marry Jewish uh, women. Moavios, Ammonios, Sidonios, Edomios, Chitios. This is the language of King Solomon. He married all these uh, non-Jewish women. In this case, he means I pursued and I read non-Jewish books and secular studies. Uh, I did do that. For El Yodea, and God in heaven knows, that the only reason I married these concubines was that they should serve as maids for my beloved main wife. Okay? She's the one I really love. I only married these concubines that they should be her hairdressers, her bakers, her, her dressmakers, and all the rest of it, to help her. Laharos amin by sarmis yafo kitos ma'iv admog to show how beautiful she is. So to use modern language, only reason I learned math and science was to help me in my understanding of Torah. We call mokum, nevertheless nismato onoso. Interesting expression. Uh, I didn't spend enough time. I ended up not spending enough time with my beloved. Right? Kind of the owner, you know. So I, I, I didn't do justice to my true wife. I had to take up a lot of time to go a lot of different directions and study a lot of subjects. The Ram was looking at his old age, writing to a very firm group, and he's saying, you know, it did cost me in learning. It did cost me. Now, a smart cookie like the young Maimonides could not help notice the yawning chasm between himself and the hamonam, the masses of the Jewish people, sometimes even the secularly educated Jewish people. All these Jews were abysmally ignorant. Now, I don't mean ignorant of philosophy and theology, that was obvious. But I mean they're ignorant of Torah. So I repeat what I said. Ramah looks around the Jewish communities in which he's located. He sees a ton of Jews, they don't know that often. They keep Shabbos the way they think their they think their parents did. You know, no, no, yeah. They keep kosher. 
the way they think is the right way to go. Um, they do a lot of mitzvahs or don't do them the way they're used to, mitzvahs of national Ramana. And even those with a secular education are dumb Jewishly. A guy could have an MD or a degree or something like that, but he doesn't anything about Judaism. And he keeps the Jewish stuff to the degree that he keeps them, again, in the, in, in the sense of mimetic, you know. Now, let's face it. It's the 1100s. How could it be otherwise? The Talmud is impenetrable. This is before Rashi. Rashi died 100 years before. Actually, Rashi died not too long before this. And his works hadn't spread. So imagine, there's no art scroll, there's no Rashi, there's no science cells, there's no English. How do you expect somebody to be able to crack the Gemara, to read it even? And certainly, to get an idea of what's really going on, and then learn it. But, you know, I mean, except for very few, it wasn't going to happen. In addition to the Amorasis, meaning the ignorance of Jewish stuff, particularly the Talmud, the Jewish public certainly had no correct ideas of Jewish theology, of correct deos, or correct hashkafa, as we would say today. Rather, the public, or most of it, was either credulous and primitive, so they believed in witchcraft, in um, superstitions, take stories, like I said, but they really think God is a finger, you know, because he put his hand on Espel him here, or something like that. Or else, they're cynical and skeptical. They're apocursum. They're part of the Jewish community. They do everything else, but really, they don't really believe in this stuff. Because read the Bible. It's such a bunch of fairy tales. Read the Talmud. It's such a bunch of fairy tales. You can't uh, really be true. That's how, that's how these guys talk. Now, both were hashkafically sinners to the Rambam, right? Uh, here, look at this. It's a very famous essay. I used to years ago in high school called the Hatoma Perichel, the Rambam's essay. And uh, this is important, so you follow along with me. The Rambam says over here, because he's criticizing non-intellectuals as well as pseudo-intellectuals, who are worse than the non-intellectuals. And the Rambam says, you must know, he's talking about Agatha now in the Gemara, that the words of the sages were differently interpreted by three groups of people. The first group is the largest one. I've observed them, read their books, and heard about them. They accept the teaching of the sages in the literal sense, and they do not think that these teachings contain any hidden meaning at all. So everything you find in the Gemara and the Chumash anywhere else is just taken literally. They believe that all sorts of impossible things um, must be possible. They hold such opinions because they do not understand science and are far from having acquired knowledge. They possess no perfection which would arouse them to insight from within, nor have they found anything to stimulate them to profounder understanding. And those, you tell me this, you really think you know God came down and uh, you know stamped on somebody? Yeah, why not? That's so. They didn't even have a question like talk after the beat. Uh, they therefore believed that the sages and the Gemara intended no more in their carefully emphatic and straightforward utterances than they themselves are able to understand with their adequate knowledge. So, like I said before, if I read in the Gemara, let's say, you know, the ground shook and the, the heavens fell down or something like that, okay, you know, they understand the teaching of the sages only in the literal sense, in spite of the fact that some of their teachings, when taken literally, seem so fantastic and irrational that if one were to repeat them literally, even to the uneducated, let alone the sophisticated, their amazement would prompt them to ask how anyone in the world could believe such things are true, much less edifying. But since it's in a book, a Jewish book, they think it's literally true. <laughs> Members of this group are poor in knowledge. One can only regret their folly. Their very effort to honor the sages in accordance with their own dumbness humiliates the sages. I swear by God, he says, this group destroys the glory of the Torah and says the opposite of what is intended. Because the Torah, we're told in the Chumash, it says, Ki rak am nobam b'chokham agoy agol azeb. The Moshe Rabbeinu tells the Jewish people that the Goyim will look at the Jews and say, there's a, a highly educated and rational people. Am chacham b'nabon agoy agol azeb. That this nation is a wise understanding people. But when they hear these guys, I'm talking about the regular, Hamona, the guy you mean shul, you know, who means well is a frumi, he thinks he's doing the right thing by believing this literally. This group expounds the laws and teachings of the sages in such a way that when other people that don't hear about them, they'll say this nation is dumb and foolish and ignoble. The worst offenders are the preachers, <laughs> we call rabbis today, the pulpit speakers, uh, who preach and expound to the masses what they themselves do not understand. So, you know, people would get up and give a, a, a speech and just tell over a story from the Gemara, plain and simple, that explaining uh, what its real meaning is, as the Ram would see it, and so forth. If only they were silent, it would be wisdom. 
Or at least they should say, we don't understand him. We don't know how to explain him. That would be good to say, I don't know. That's a madrega. But they do believe they understand. That's the problem. And they vigorously expound to the people what they think, rather than what the sages said. They therefore give lectures to the people, brachas, and in the Sanhedrin, notice the Agatha says stuff, and other texts, expounding them word for word according to their literal meaning. And it drives somebody like the Rambam crazy. Now let's go to the other group. Next one. The second group is also numerous. It consists of persons who, having read and heard the words of the sages, understand them according to their literal sense, and believe the sages were dummies. They understand them according to their literal sense, and they intended nothing other than what people learned from the literal interpretation. So in other words, the attitude of these people is, if it says Ramon Gamil said, the moon jumped over the spoon, Ramon Gamil was a dummy, that's what he thought. You know, that's how these guys are. Inevitably, they declare the sages to be fools, hold them to contempt and slander, that which does not deserve to be slandered. They imagine that their own intelligence is of a higher order than that of the Chachamim, and that the sages were simpletons who suffer from interior, inferior intelligence. The members of this group are so pretentiously stupid, meaning these skeptics, are so stupid that they can never attain a genuine wisdom because they're arrogant. Most of these guys are MDs, right? He says, um, they have stumbled in error which involved with medicine and astrology. They regard themselves as cultivated men, scientists, critics, and philosophers. How remote they are from true humanity compared to real philosophers. Here, yeah, I told you before, the realm side is, these are busy community college, you know. They're not real philosophy. They're, they're morons, okay? They are more stupid than the first group, some are fools. Now, they're educated. They can be scientists, doctors, lawyers, this, that, and the other. But in Judaism, they're stupid. That's his point. This is an accursed group because the attempt to refute men of established greatness is wisdom has been demonstrated competent men of science. It was making fun of the Chazal. If these fools had worked in science hard enough to know how to write accurately without theology, about theology and similar subjects, for the mass and the educated, those if you understood the necessity of, of framing abstract ideas in concrete form, even in this case of marshals of parables, and if they understood the relevance of philosophy, then they would be in a position to understand sages were in fact wise or not, and the real meaning of their teachings would be clear to them. And then the Ramu, of course, goes on and says, I guess. And then there's me, right? Here's a third group. Its members are so few in number, it's hardly called, you can't call them a group, except in the sense that one speaks of the sun as a group which is the only member. So basically he's saying like this, then there's me. I'm the only guy who gets this right. What can I say is the truth? Is the truth? You know? This group consists of men for whom the greatness of the sages is clear. So they respect the Chazal. They recognize the superiority of their intelligence from their words which point to exceedingly profound truths. In other words, if Rabbi Kiva says something that sounds dumb, but elsewhere, Rabbi Kiva says something that's very profound. You see, the man was smart. So then, he's not a simpleton. So if he says something that's simple, the question goes, what does he mean? To use modern terminology, if I say that this guy over here believes that two and two equals five, I say, he's a dummy. A lot of people don't know arithmetic. Now listen closely. Suppose they tell you Albert Einstein said two plus two equals five. Ooh, what does he mean? Obviously, Albert Einstein knows that two and two doesn't equal five. If he said it, there's a shot behind it, right? What does he mean? That, he says, is how you supposed to work when you get to Adonis and Chazal and Sukkim and all the rest of it. That is classic Maimonidean, right? Even though this third group is few and scattered, their books teach the perfection which is achieved by the authors and the high level of truth which they had attained. In other words, the realm of the saying, read my book if you want to cop what's going on. The members of this group understand that the sages knew as clearly as we do the difference between the impossibility of the possible and the existence of that which must exist. They know the sages did not speak nonsense, and it's clear to them that the words of the sages contain an obvious and a hidden meaning, like I said before, is parables. You see? Then, whenever sages spoke of that which seems impossible, they're employing the style of riddle and parable, which is the method of truly great thinkers, and so forth. All students of rhetoric, he says at the bottom, know the real concern of a parable is with its hidden meaning and not with its obvious meaning. Okay? So, anyway, you get the idea. So this is the world, here we have, and Rama wrote this in his 20s, what you just read, and you see how he surveys the Jewish world, okay? Now, and by the way, true intellectuals is one, <laughs> you know, or two. 
There's very few of us that actually know what we're talking about. That's his attitude. Now, how does one go ahead and fix this problem? The Rambam is not a person simply to throw his head up and say, the sky is falling. How do you fix the problem? Now I'm going to explain my mind of these. My, how I would explain it to you. And that is the Rambam undertook to create a middle brow literature. And he did do so. When I was a kid, when you went to the uh, supermarket, they didn't have the National Enquirer and who knows what else over there. I was junk. Um, they had World Book, various encyclopedias, American history, the real little uh, sets, geography. Do you remember this? Popular science, uh, famous paintings. You could buy them. It was like a book. My father used to buy it. So it's one of my early history books, actually. Good. My father bought a couple of books. We went to a you know, in American history or something like that. Uh, and maybe, uh, and then geography, I recall, and things like that. When the book of knowledge, whatever. What's the idea behind that? You're not becoming a PhD from that, but you're becoming an educated person to some degree. It's called middle brow culture. This has collapsed in America, I'm sorry to say. And now, I have no idea what they have in the, uh, in the AMP and so on and so forth. Um, but I'm sure it's uh, not edifying literature. Is a tantalizing literature, right? Uh, it's a shame. So this attempt to create an educated public, not at the sophisticated professorial level, but you should be a person who knows about basic things out there. Frankly, what I'm doing at this very moment, speaking to you along these lines, and you're doing by listening, this is called middle brow culture. Okay, not high brow, not lower. It's middle brow. It was an attempt to raise the level of the American public, or significant portions of it, to become more cultured, more cultivated. No epis about history, no epis about philosophy. Maybe there used to be a lot of philosophy books. You know, written at a dumbed-down level, but nevertheless, the, the guy writes it at a lower level, but it picks you up to a higher level. That's my point. That is who the Rambam was for a long time. He decided to turn himself into a one-man art scroll in his 20s. The project was to take the impenetrable and make it penetrable. In this case, he started in his 20s with the Mishnahis. So everybody who knows, the Rambam, in the ages of 23 to 30 or so, something like that, wrote a piece from the Mishnah. Nobody had done that before. He, he broke ground. The Mishnahis itself, here and there is easy, but a lot of places are hard. I'll just give you an example. Kachim Tyrus. But much else is wrong, but much else as well. And that means to explain the Mishnah, you have to know the Gemara. Just take it from me. Now, um, who was able to do this? Well, people have spent many years executing such enterprises. The Rambam was the first guy to do it. He wrote it in Arabic, Judeo-Arabic. That's an Arabic language with Jewish letters. And he wrote it when he was in his 20s, which is a humongous project. And it's as good as any of the others, like a Bartonor, a Kahati, all the rest of it. And he broke ground. And what was the purpose of it? Uh, you know, any Tom, Dick, and Harry. If you're willing to sit down and plug away, you can learn Mishnahis. Anayim Azeh. If that's what you wish to do, you can learn Mishnahis with the Rambam. He has a different way than the Bartanura, but I won't go into that. But the bottom line is, he wanted to make it able for the average person out there, not the dummy, not people who don't have time and all the rest of it, but the middle brow individual I'm talking about before. The middle class person who has kids. I might say like this, you know, I never had an education, but I want my son to get an education. I'm going to get this, I'm going to make a, 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 buy a copy of the set of the Rambam, one of the this young scholar coming out of Morocco or wherever, and, uh, and my son will learn Mishnahis. And believe you me, we know throughout history, Mishnahis functions at many levels. One of its glorious levels has always been middle brow culture. In Eastern Europe, you used to have Chav Mishnahis. This is why the Bartonura wrote the Bartonura. This is why the Tosis Yantu results did so. The Marala Prague made a big deal about Shulam uh, it, it is important, <clears throat> and the person who knows Kahati Mishnais pretty well, isn't it? Or now with the art school, they have it. They came out with a very nice one. In uh, I don't know what these were dumbed down, but you know what I mean. It made very simple. I know people myself who have been turned to Mishnais by this new art school uh, translation. Not the old regular Mishnais one, the new one. All these are attempts to make somebody into a Jewish mensch. I didn't say you're a Bucky Vishas. I don't say you know the Shulchan Aruch Kol or the rest of it. But you know Mishnahis, you're doing pretty well. That's why my middle brow culture. And the Ramah says I'm going to make something because nobody else is doing it. Okay? Now, 
In addition, in the Pirish Mishnah that he writes, in his 20s, he has all these cute philosophical essays, theological essays, such as the one I just read you a minute ago about the three types of, of uh, skeptics out there and so forth, in which he endeavors here and there to provide basic, what we call yedios, clolios, basic facts about Judaism that, take it from me, the average guy in Shiva does not know, and certainly the average person outside Shiva doesn't know. But I'm talking about before the internet, now you're all cheap. I'm talking about before that, okay? So, uh, in his introduction to the Mishnah, he gives the history of the Mishnahites, the history of Torah literature in his way. Uh, he has essays about prophecy, how that works, which is very confusing. His introduction to Tyrus is a, uh, is a masterpiece, everybody knows that, because it's such a difficult subject. The introduction to Perichelu talks about basic philosophical and theological issues that we'll get back to before. This is how somebody learns about what Judaism is. Not simply, I like the Shabbos candles because my mother likes Shabbos candles. But what is Judaism? I don't know, you know. I like the candles because my mother likes the candles. I go to Shul because my father went to Shul. I put on scissors because my father went to put on scissors. I don't know. He's a round up to that. There's a lot of basic middle brow uh, uh, ideas that you can put out there, and he did. Okay? Now, it's not... He wanted to change the cultural reality. Not to be like uh, these guys he described here before. Uh, and it's not the system of uh, day schools in Torah Masara. That's a different way. This is a thousand years ago. He's trying to do it through literature. That is the Rambab is. Um, in this essay that we talked about before, where you talk about the different types of skeptics about Agatha, it's called Introduction to Parachalic. That's where he articulates the 13 principles which he holds that you have to believe. The Animamans, as we call them today. So the first time, this guy in his 20s is saying, you're not a Jew. You're not a Jew in good standing if you don't adhere to these 13 theological beliefs. A lot of people never even heard of them. Never gave thought to them. And he's saying, get out. Because I want everybody to know the basics of Judaism. I repeat, the basics of Judaism. And so he, he provides the grounding, if you want to call that, for Jewish philosophy in a very simple and clear way. The social significance of the fact that Unlike other philosophical works, which is, Rambam was the first guy to write a philosophy book, Sadi Gomer wrote a book, Kos Alvovas, Yudal Levi. The essays in the Rambam are written in a middle brow, accessible form for a mass audience. I hope you paid attention to what I read before, and I ran through it. Take it from me, he's a good writer. That means to say he gave a lot because he studied rhetoric when he was young, the rules of rhetoric. He's very careful how he constructs his essays. I think most people know. The Rambam is the finest writer the Jewish people produce, certainly in the Middle Ages. And when you read stuff from the Rambam, you can agree and disagree, but it's very clear. You understand? It's very clear. And he has a beginning, a middle, and an end, and all the rest of it. And so he's clearly aiming for a mass audience in the way that Rashi or Tosa or Rashi or people like that did not. Because the Talmudic literature is an elitist literature. And he's not writing an elitist literature. He's trying to bring some of the elite information down to the level that anybody else can understand it. So I call it art scroll. Okay? You, you know what I mean. Okay? Now, uh, in Egypt, he moves, when he's 27, 28 actually, and I said he remains the rest of his life, he gets married, he becomes a Dayan, because his brother's running the family jewelry business, Rob and his brother, they make their parnosa from jewelry business, and the brother basically says, this is, you saw his woolen situation, I'll do the work you shouldn't learn, because I see you don't waste your time, you really are learning, and uh, here's a guy who's married, his late 20s. Um, think about that. But he's able to sit and learn Yom Belayla. What is he learning Yom Belayla? Gemara and, and that sort of thing. And all this philosophy, math, and science stuff that I described before. This is what he, this is what he loves. This is what he throws himself into. He does get a job simplifying the story as a dying, and he stays a dying for the next rest of his life. A dying means you're in the basin. And so every day, drama is what we call today a rabbi. He's on the Baltimore Basin, you know. You have to deal with all kinds of questions, Chosha Mishma questions, marriage and divorce questions, ritual questions about Shabbos and Kashrus and all the rest of it. And so here's somebody who's not an ivory tower scholar in the sense that he literally secludes himself in the room and don't talk to anybody else. He secludes himself plenty of room, but every day he's engaged with people, litigants coming back and forth and debating with his fellow jurists and all the rest of it. And that's who he is. Now, the reason he got this job right away is he came having published a masterpiece. 
I mean, the guy was 20 years old, 28 years old. He came to Egypt and he published the Barton Nur, so to speak. So people are like, whoa, this guy's obviously an A-plus scholar, and he's able to get that job. And the Rama was honest. He was refined. He was secularly educated, particularly in Arabic culture. He was diplomatic. Because the Torah teaches you to do all this, if you read it right. That's what he says. And he knew how to win favor from the Jewish community and the Gaisha government. Matter of fact, the Jewish community would be happy that a guy like him would represent before the government because he was a guy who speaks Arabic well, he's highly educated. What we, we would say today have the equivalent of an Ivy League, League education. The Arabs themselves respect that. You understand? Plus, not to put too fine a point on it, the, the, this guy has spent time within Islam. So he, you know, as Murano. So he really understands the non Jewish men's mindset. He remained a dying for the rest of his life, in fact, the chief dying. It's important to remember all this. Now, having done Art School Project number one, which was the Mishnayas, which is impressive enough, the Rambam at the age of 29 now undertook to do the entire Shas, the entire Talmud, which is an infinitely bigger project than the Mishnayas, especially when I say the Talmud, I mean the whole business. Bavli, Yerushalmi, the Halachic Midrash, and Sifra, Sifri, Mechilta, Tosefta, and all the rest of it. Because that's what the Mishnah Torah is. Now, um, I don't know what the Ram had in mind when he started this project at 29 years old. But we do know what evolved in the, evolved in the end now is the so-called Mishnah Torah or the Second Torah. Right? Now, this is ultimately the ultimate middle brow project. This is you standing in line in the AMP, whatever store, and you can buy the Talmud uh, dumbed down. Because Ramam Bab, as we all know, what you should know, takes the entire Shas and condenses it to its final uh, bottom line rulings, and then he organizes in a very clear and logical way, because he loved logic and clarity and system and organization, all the halachas, and you can look anything up. So it's not the same thing exactly as learning the Gemara inside. For, some pe for many, many people, it's better. The reason I say that is they're never going to crack the Gemara. They won't really understand it. This way you'll understand what, what the Gemara wants you to say. The counter-argument is you don't really understand unless you learn the Gemara. And that was a famous debate at that time. It's one of the things they criticized him for. But he is trying, in his essential uh, goal, to take the dumb public out there that doesn't know anything and make them undumb. For example, you have Shabbos. Any two guys that get together, he wrote in very clear Hebrew. He expected the average guy to be able to read at least basic, simple, clear Hebrew. And if you take the trouble and you care to, you can learn all the halachas of Shabbos from the entire Masech of Shabbos and elsewhere in Shabbos, if that's what you wish to do. You can learn the entire halachas, I don't know, uh, Beis HaMikdash, Yisuri Bio, um, Gitin, uh, you know, uh, Tony Benitton, all, all, all the halachas are out there, and, and you know where to find them. He has a table of contents and all the rest of it. So he basically established the ultimate middle brow project. So let, let, let me explain in simple terms. Suppose you're somebody who doesn't have much of a background. And you're not doing elite uh, status and money to spend time learning yeshiva or something like that in those days. If you say like this, I'm going to get a tutor, and we're going to go through Homish Nice with the Realm Mom's commentary, and then we're going to do the Homish Nantar, which can be done. This here is the Homish Nantar, minus the fruit salad. Right? It's just the Realm Mom with any of the Mepharshim commentaries. It's a big book. But it ain't the biggest book in the world. This is not the Encyclopedia Britannica. It could be done. If I gave you an assignment every day to learn one page or something like that, you know, there's no question it could be done. And it's very clear and logical and organized. And so the result is anybody can learn Kol Tarakula in a certain way. It's not the same as learning the Gemara, but in a certain way. And you come out knowing a heck of a lot. Don't tell me how the glass is half empty. I get that. Be amazed that the glaze is half full. You can know a lot from learning the Rambam, and people have done that ever since. Okay? So, um, this is the ultimate middle brow project. In fact, his introduction is very famous, because what does he see over here? After writing a long history of how he got to the, you know, the Torah, got to where it is today in his time, Bisman is that talked with Sarah Ciceros. Nowadays, um, the political situation has gone down to two. Jews are in bad shape. Dach Gasha is a call, we're all in persecution. Abdu Chachamas Chachamena Venus and Venus and Statra, 
even our elites are no good. So all the books that have been written to explain the Talmud by various authors, Roshim Tvarim of Warm, and seemed clear at the time those guys wrote it, Niska should be a man. Nowadays nobody can crack those books. Nobody can properly, properly uh, read and, and uh, digest their books on the Shas, except very few. Especially if you read the Gomorrah inside, not a cheater book. You know, who, who today, and this is as true today as it was then, you need a high IQ, you need a big um, drive, you need a lot of time. <laughs> Are you willing to put in six, ten hours a day for many, many years? A one-sided education? And only then will you begin to understand what's happening. After you go through it all, go to the next one. Therefore, I put on my belt. I place my trust in the Lord. And I did the work for you. <laughs> right? You don't have to do it. I went through all those books for you. And I'm crunching it all together. I'm synthesizing everything from the Bible, Yishalmi, Michal, the Sifri, all that stuff. I'm crunching it all together for you. Being an awesome motor, Tommy Torah, Shardin, and Torah. All the halachic literature, kulam belosh and brura. I made an effort that it should all be clear, b'derek kitzar and succinct. Ache tikar bal pet kulam sturfi akol lokasha per. So everybody can know the whole Torah about that. Meaning, as they say before, in a middle brow sense, you can understand the whole Torah uh, without kashas and, and, and answers. Lo zem b'kol zem kol. Not like a yeshiva. This one says this. This is this. You know the lady says rabbi. I got a milk and get spoon and flesh and go Oh, it's very interesting. And the Ramam holds this way. And the Shach says this. And the Prima Gunnam says that. And they say, What's the problem? <laughs> what do I do? What do I do? So that's the Ramam. This is, I'm giving the answer now. Without questions and answers and different opinions. Okay? Clear words. Based on my analysis and synthesizing. Of all the stuff that's been written from the time of Moses down to the present day. I should call din and gluten cut like God. So all the din in the Torah are now clear or available, I would say today, to anybody old or young. All the rules, the Raisa, the Rabbana, Minhagim, and all the rest of it. Anything you find in the Talmud, and sometimes a little bit more, is in my book. So if you take the trouble to sit down and read the book, which I tell you is a fat book, but it's not that fat. And you know it well, you learn it well, and master it. You know a lot. Now, don't come to me and say, "Well, you don't know Rashi." You know, true, but you know a lot. Okay. So it's like today we would say, suppose there was a. This is what Kito wanted with the Sefer Todah. Many people dream about this. A basic, a book of basic Judaism. Okay, a book of basic Judaism, but not a, a you know a, a, a superficial one. One gives you all the meat, but presented in a very simple way. Anybody can understand everything. Here's a famous controversial statement. So that nobody needs any book except you need two books. Right? So all you need is the Chumash and my book, because my book contains all the information of there, the derises, the Rabbanas, the Akonis, all the resident. That's why I call my book a second Torah. Just read the Chumash. Read my book. And you know the whole Torah You don't need to read any other book. Now, later on, the critics tell you, Oh, you're trying to knock the Nobu Shore, only read your book and not read the Gemara. No, that's not what the Ramah meant. As I told you before, I'm presenting my Maladis today. And he was a great popularizer. This was the great goal of his life. Certainly the first half of his life. And he is trying to introduce a middle-brow culture to raise the cultural level of all the Jews. I'll say it again. If everybody used this uh, book the way he wanted to, you'd have a pretty well-educated public out there, which is what he wanted. Okay? Now, it gets a little dicey. Had the Ram, because he wasn't so diplomatic, had the Ram said, 
you know, this book is only for the Hamonam, the masses. This is not for the Talmud Chachamim. Obviously, you Torah scholars don't need myself. You know it on your own. This is just for the masses. Just to give them a window into Torah. An inadequate window, to be sure. But it's just at least a window. If the Ramam had said that, it would have saved him a lot of trouble and criticism. This is, after all, my friends, the PC approach of our school. When our school comes up with the Gemaras, I was part of it. What did they say? They said, listen, the English Gemaras are not for the Talmud HaChachamim. It's not for the Rebbe's, for the Magashir. It's for the BT's. Now, people in Nebuchadnezzar who had no Aslach in Yeshiva, you know what I'm saying? The article said like this, our Gemara's are B'dyevet. That way, you don't get attacked by the Yeshiva world. You know what I'm saying? It's not true, but it's a diplomatic thing to say. Right? It's not true. Now, again, the article doesn't intend to knock out regular Yeshiva learning, but it's quite a handy business. You know, I spend a lot of time on myself, and I know my colleagues spend a lot of time Doing this, I mean, a lot of time and effort, so it's it's quite an achievement not to knock out the regular shivas and they don't. But on the other hand, it is meant for the broad public. What do I mean when I say a broad public? You mean a shiva guy, after he learns, a learned person, even after he learns the Gemara, all the rest of it, sometimes say this, I just want to make sure I got this right, or see what I say compared to what it says in the article. You, you get what I'm saying? That kind of thing. Now, my Maimonides was not built that way. He clearly didn't mean he wanted people to stop learning, because that's not who he was. You know, just because he had my book, there, there's no reason to learn Kumar. Although as a professional dying, he knew that his book, I mean, let me put it this way, as a professional dying, he knew that his book is not one you can simply look up and know the din. The halach is of such a nature that if you want to really understand the basis of the law, you have to understand the reasoning and the discussion of the Gemara behind it. Otherwise, you just follow blindly the end line in the Gemara, which circumstances may change and make your ruling the incorrect one. If I made myself um, unclear in what I just said, confusing, I'll put it in simple terms. The Gemara says, for example, Chesed is a shal that you, if you don't have a deed to your house, so uh, for three years we presume that the house is yours. I'm talking about adverse possession and that sort of thing. Three years. Um, so you might say, well, that's a Talmudic rule. So everybody has an adverse possession thing in this house for three years. No. The Gemara explains, because at that time, people used to keep their, their deeds for three years, and they would lose them. But now in America, we have a completely different reality. Everything's online. And so the law has to change. It's not you're challenging the Talmud. You're using the language, the, the logic of the Talmud, to apply the law in the correct way. Maimonides does this himself in his childhood and Jews, in his response as a dying. He didn't simply blindly, blindly uh, follow what he himself wrote in the book, in the bottom line of the Gemara. There are many cases like this, right? So, the Rambam wasn't a dummy. He knew that. that this is not the final ruling. It's a middle brow project. But you know a whole lot about the state of play if you know the Gemaras and the final rulings of the Gemaras, right? He didn't say you don't have to use a rabbi anymore, or if you have a shal, you, you don't have to go to basin anymore, or something like that. But you walk in with a basic knowledge of what's going on. That is my opinion. Now, at the end of the day, the Mishnah Bura is simply a collection of Maskanas, of final um, rulings and discussion in the Gemara. So thanks to his literary skill, you can't often see the reasoning behind it. The Ram is an excellent writer, and so he will weave in uh, a fair amount of time the reasoning behind the rules. But you never have the benefit of the Shackle entire, the actual uh, Gemara itself, especially the different sukkahs located in different places, which is necessary to understand the reasoning behind it. I don't want to go explain that too much. Remember, in the case of the Rambam, we're not talking about a regular Magad Shir in a yeshiva somewhere. We're talking about a Dayan from a family of Dayanim. Such a person, a yeshiva guy who learns Erevin, and then when it's all over, he doesn't know how to make Erev, is a waste of time. <laughs> right? The guy learns Gittin, and they say, have you ever seen a get? No, I never said a get. <laughs> but you don't know what to do with it? I don't know what to do with it. So then what you learn getting for? Oh, it's a lot of lumps and this and any other. The Ram loves the Halal, he's a dying. He said, then you wasted your time. Uh, the other day, what, let's go to the next one. Uh, my Rebbe Arudumi used to say, if you learn something le more or less than four or five times, uh, you're not even the kind of Talmud Torah. Not even the kind of Talmud Torah. Not even the kind of Talmud Torah. Not even the kind of Talmud Rhetorically, you know. Um, maybe not. The Ramam knows this. You know, 
learning by itself, for itself, isn't a goal. Learning for understanding, you see? Understanding. You think I'm exaggerating. Let's go to the next one. The Rambam writes in a letter to one of his students, where he says, Yeshiva learning is almost like a waste of time. Rashi says, I want you to get a copy of my book and spread it and teach it to others to increase it uh, because it, it, it's a great utility. The, the purpose of the Talmudic discussions finds its final conclusion in my book. You, know, you don't need all the back and forth arguments. And the bottom line of the yeshiva guys who spend their time in the pill pool and the lambdas, Kilo Yazman is a waste of time. Just going back and forth in the argumentation in the Talmud. Kila Kamana Talim Bikoh Lozosa. As if the Lumdis itself is the goal. And the Ram said the Lumdis is not the goal of the Gemara, to learn the Pelpo. So that's Lahari said Kamana Rishana. That wasn't the idea when they put the Gemara together. The idea was to give you straight laws. The Gemara was originally meant to be written as a straight law code. But Hamasa Man Bikoh Nafu Mekrik Shama Shalga Pirsho Neg Pirsho Pirsh Akhar Bikilufo. When different people, when a certain halachic subject arose, and let's see, Rabbi Kiva held this way, Rabbi Gamil held that way, so that it's necessary to have the debate in the Gemara to describe both sides, or three or four sides, to come to a conclusion, right? To know what to do. But not, and that's obvious to you. Um, but to say that that's the point is, uh, is ridiculous. There have been people, the Ramchal holds like that also. It's not the yeshiva style. Okay, Rambam is not what you call yeshiva. It's not what he was. He was, as they say, if anything, a local message type guy. And look at the last line. Notice, Kamati Bechibur Zeh, my whole intention of writing this book, Lafanus Adrachim Asir Machos Mithnea Talmidim, to help the guys in the yeshiva themselves, who are learning all the lumps, all the rest of it, when so over, they don't have any clerk height. Shlotachosh Gaitam Yerob Master Matan, they shouldn't get discouraged. From all this, this discussion, the morning, the guy said, yeah, I'm not good at this. I'm going to give up. No, no, you have my book. You can see what the final uh, result is. I want these guys to come out getting smich and not know what they're doing in So it's very funny. Despite his protestations, he did want his book to be used in yeshivas as an indispensable aid to clarity. Now, remember, this is before Rashi's uh, commentary was around and circulated. But right from the publication, many yeshiva types dissed the book, and they spurned it, like they do to our school. And therefore, in the next slide, the Ram says there are inferior scholars here in Egypt who won't open my book. It's a matter of policy, because they don't mind apply no more to them. This is Mamish, like, you know, I know guys who I'm not looking to our school. He said, but listen, you know, you get clarity. Uh, no, no, I'm looking at our school. Right? On the other hand, the broad public liked the book. Some complained it was in Hebrew, by the way, because they went in Arabic. There can be no question of a success as a middle-brow home run. And there were some serious scholars who valued it highly, though it didn't mean that they were just going to roll over and accept whatever he said. It's clear that the Rambam reacted to those types of scholars the way they reacted to him. If they were respectful, he was super respectful to them, and indeed welcomed their scholarly criticisms. This would be what we call the Chachmei Luniel. Rabbis in southern France, who were big Talmud Chachabid, real players, and they wrote him very respectfully, and they said, you know, we have questions on your code, and we have some cautions on all the rest of it. Boy, he writes, I'm so happy to get your questions. Let me tell you something. If you read their cautions in the Mishnah Torah, sometimes the Rambam says, you know, you're right, I'm wrong, I'm in this name. Or it's misprint, or something like that. <laughs> you know, hand in trouble. There he, you're nice to me, I'm nice to you. Get it? On the other hand, if they were not respectful, if these criticisms were coming from a bad place, Maimonides reacted with icy politeness, unsuccessfully masking a cold contempt. This was the case with Dagon Shmuel ben Eli, who was the Rosh Hashim in Baghdad, who criticized the Rambam's permission to travel on great rivers on Shabbos. It's a famous, famous thing. Are you allowed to go on a riverboat, you know, to cross from one side of the city to the other on a boat? When Shabbos, the Rambam says yes. In Bubble, they said no. And, oh boy, you read this correspondence. The guy from Baghdad said, I guess, I don't know if you've seen this, but, you know, the Gemara says so-and-so, as if the Ram's a dummy. And Ram writes back, I actually did see the Gemara. It doesn't mean the way you say. 
Um, I'm sure this is what you meant to say, this and that and the other. You know, each one's got a dagger for the other one. Okay? To his student, right? Um, he wrote a whole uh, private letter, I must say, uh, dissing the whole going as, as a loser, a a loser. That's the next one. I knew, he writes his student, this is a private letter. He said, I knew when I wrote to Mishnah Torah, it would fall in the hands of malevolent and jealous men who would disparage its merit, seeing it as unnecessary or flawed. It would also fall in the hands of foolish and naive men who wouldn't understand what it's about and think of it a little use, and in the hands of silly and confused novices who would question because of their lack of knowledge or their limited ability to replicate my reasoning, and in the hands of those who regarded themselves as God-fearing and stupid. Right? Yet are stupid. Uh, that's what he's talking about, okay? Now, uh, on the other hand, there were some tough critics of his that he respected, you know, as players. Like the Ravid, the Ramah knew about him. The Ravid, who's a famous guy, criticized the Ramah always in the Gemara, was uh, living in southern France. He was a multimillionaire. He had his own yeshiva. He was what we call today extreme right winger, not interested in any secular studies whatsoever. He knew the Talmud cold. Um, and he viciously attacked the Ramah. He said he made a lot of mistakes here and there and there. Look what he says. Komash Kazab Khan, this is a famous uh, place in Kalayan. Everything the Ramam writes here, Ain Lushosh, but Gamar below Tesafto. He has no source for it in the Talmud. Below Sechel Mur, it's not even logical. Bukhut Sikh Shloshim Lomi as a club, and so forth. Bakai Roshi, I swear by the by my life, the author says. Luli Kim Lakha Gdol also. If not for the fact that this Maimani's guy pulled off a monumental project. Basi Fasa Divik Mar Yushami to Safta. He assembled all the Talmudic literature. It's quite a marvel. If not for that, Hayisim Asr Bolov Asiv Asam, who's a king of Chachamah, I would excommunicate him. I would convene a convention and excommunicate him. Kishon Alina Alashonus Amlisas, because he changed the languages of the Halacha. He got it all wrong. See, so there's some tough critics over here, right? But nevertheless, a guy like him, he would so the Gon in Babylonia, he considers really a, he's just a little, uh, you know, you think you know something and you're a dummy. The rabbit, he won't consider a dummy. Um, in general, I would characterize the whole issue of reactions to his law code in the following terms. Of course, he knew that there would be scholarly criticisms of individual rulings here and there. This was natural, particularly in the case of Talmudic law. But Maimonides wanted the public, including the scholars, to at least acknowledge the monumental achievement of the Mishnah Torah, which is what the Chachmi Luniel did. He wanted to acknowledge as the greatest work of Torah literature since the Gemara had been published. And it was, even the rabbi says, like, monumental. He didn't like the nitpicking. He didn't like the people who said, well, you didn't include any footnotes. It's a good point. He didn't include footnotes, and sometimes it caused confusion. He himself was sometimes tripped up by a lack of footnotes. He didn't include any kind of memorandum, any names, and that was considered insulting. There was the accusation that he was against yeshiva learning and wanted to, his book to replace the Talmud, which is not the case. A middle bow project doesn't seek to replace the professors and the high study book. It simply tries to popularize, in the best sense of the word, the material for a broad public. As I indicated before, though we didn't frame it this way, he was doing a middle brow project. His audience was the middling but not expert public who could read the Hebrew. A lot of guys are good people, right? They would take the trouble to plow through his book and learn a lot. And he also wanted, by the way, to be perfectly honest, for the B-level rabbi in time, the guy needs a cheater book. Let's face it, not everybody knows, not every rabbi knows everything. This way, before Pesach, the Ramah figured the God read my Hulk Pesachim, eight chapters, and I'll know what's flying in Pesach. You know, that, that kind of way. Okay? Also, he wanted it, as his audience, the fully competent scholar who ought to have recognized or have an aesthetic appreciation of the wonderful literary style and presentation of the Mishnah Torah. I mean, cold her cool. That's the Chachmin that people should say, as they do today. You know, I'm not giving up the Gemara, the rest of it. But the Rambam is very impressive. <laughs> like that. And the way he organized the Judaism is so unorganized. The Talmud is so unorganized. Here's a guy who put it all together. Just aesthetically, it's a pleasure to read. That's what he wanted. Now, with the benefit of hindsight, we can see today that any hope that the Mishnah Torah would become Mamish, a Mishnah Torah, an actual final law club, was intrinsically doomed to failure on several grounds. This is something that's always uh, fascinating me, but I guess you have to have hindsight to see it. The Rambam really thought that he had a law code. There's no code of law out there that people just follow 
unless there's political power behind it. We live in a place called Baltimore, Maryland. I don't think anybody's going to make the argument that the members of the city council of Baltimore, Maryland are the smartest people that ever lived. It doesn't matter. If they pass the law, it counts. It's part of the law code because they got the political power to do so under our system. Same thing with the legislature in Annapolis. Nobody's going to say they're the biggest bunch of eggheads that ever lived. But they got, they are, it's a law because they are the constituted authority. And same with the feds. Now, the Jews didn't have a, a government. They didn't have a state. So the Ram is just one guy. I don't care how smart he is. How do you make something a code if you're going to have the political force behind it? He didn't see it. He, obviously, he saw it. It's going to be so brilliant that people will just acknowledge its brilliance and bend over and bow down to it, which was ridiculous. Okay? Second, in order to do it right, you have to do like Rabbi Yosef Kara. You'd have to write a Shulchan Aruch and a Beis Yosef. He would have had to write his book, and then a book explaining all the sources. Now, if he had just spent the rest of his life doing that, perfecting it, saying, you know, I wrote this about Elchus Shabbos, and here's where I got it from, and, I wrote, and this is my reasoning, and I wrote this in Hulk's Gittin and so forth, and here's my reasoning, then he would have uh, silenced many of his critics. You understand? Or maybe not, I don't know. But he didn't do that. He just has this apoptitic nature, very apoptitic. This is how it is, you know. Um, and finally, had he succeeded in writing an actual code of law, Judaism would have died. And again, he didn't see that. We rely on Judaism to survive. We have to rely on the Torah being flexible and being interpreted and reinterpreted all the time. Within parameters. Within parameters. I'm not talking about Reform Judaism. We need a heck of a lot of flexibility. And the Jewish system, let me put it this way. Halachas don't come from law codes. They come from the Shahs and Shuvahs. That's how it works. Okay? Anybody knows the inner works in the Jewish law, you don't get it from the law codes, not the Shulchan Aruch, not the Torah, not the Ramah, or anybody else. Not from the Mishnah Baruch. You get it from the constantly changing circumstances and the new Piskei Aloha that emerged classically in the response to literature or whatever. That's why now you have the Mishnah Baruch, now you have the Piskei Chuvas, which brings the Mishnah Baruch up to date. Because the Mishnah Baruch died whenever he died, and ever since then, in America we have Rosh Feinstein, in Israel you have the Chazanisha, and the Shlom Zarbach, etc., etc., etc. But Yosef, the Aloha doesn't die. Right? If you have a final code, you say, the mission of birth is the beginning and the end, and that's it, then the time's going to come when that'll kill Judaism. And Ram didn't see that. Um, in the Middle Ages, he didn't have that, that point of view. It's just interesting. Now, um, because I repeat, the Rambam himself doesn't possibly like his code when it comes to response to when he was really dealing with real life cases. Right? Every case is sort of autonomous in terms of its facts and the requirements of the case. Either you know that, or you don't know that. Um, but as I mentioned last week, the Yerushu Ragun said that's the ideal of the Torah. That's why they didn't want it written down in the first place. My friends, although these clashes and controversies accompany the publication of the Mishnah Torah in the 1170s, this is not what we mean by the Maimonidean controversies. Rather, that term refers to something I've not touched on yet. And that is the Rambam's own ideas of hashkafa matters, on questions of religious beliefs and even unbeliefs. In other words, some people then and later challenge his opinions on certain matters of belief, thinking that he did not believe in them. Others challenge certain beliefs of his, and they claim that those beliefs of his, which the Rambam demanded of others, were incorrect. So these were not challenges to specific rulings of his in regular halacha, which we just talked about. These were attacks on his hashkafas, and they were intensified after he published his third and final great book. As we saw, the Rambam wrote his Mishnah commentary in his 20s. He wrote his Britannica on Shas, the Mishnah Torah, in his 30s. He was able to do so because he didn't have to work for a living. Right? He didn't have a 9-to-5 job. Being a Dayan was not an impediment to writing a law code. Being a Dayan is actually helpful. You're always holding in the Dinim. You know, you're always looking through the swarm. These two monumental books engaged primarily his textual Torah scholarship, his mastery of Shas and all its components, indeed his amazing Bikiyas, including Bikiyas and Iyun. And that's what gives uh, his, his, his uh, boon on the Mishnah, and then his law code, um, that's what gives his book on the Mishnah Torah and the law code, um, special excellence, his great mastery of the material. I said primarily because the Mishnah book and the Mishnah Torah book, primarily about Shas and Asukashmai Silibid Hilksa, finding the final halachic rulings of all the discussions of the Gemara. 
But there are parts of the two books which are not about ritual and civil laws. Fast as they are. There are parts of both books, the commentary to the Mishnah and his code, the Mishnah Torah, which dealt with philosophy, including natural philosophy, or science as we call it today, and theology. They're in the Hakam to the uh, during the uh, Pirish of Mishnahis and during the Mishnah Torah. In these parts, the Rambam defines religious terms and concepts with the goal of weeding out incorrect ideas held by Jews, ideas about God and various descriptions of him, ideas about heaven and hell, reward and punishment, life after death, the Mashiach, and all other kinds of ideas. The key word here is ideas. He is concentrating on ideas, not on rituals and practices in these sections. And he is saying Judaism requires not only certain practices, that Judaism requires certain beliefs. Whoever does not adhere to these beliefs is a heretic and a sinner and will burn in hell. Now this was new and it's a gross violation of the fuzzy nominism that I've always spoken about and, and did in the first lecture. Where Judaism always insists on, on ritual practice exactness. That's where we get OCD of them. But now the Hashkafas, you know, this one believes this, now one believes that, within parameters. The Ram is the opponent of that. He said, this is exactly what you have to believe. Anyone who deviates from this doctrine is bad. Okay? Now, uh, what's interesting is, here's a, a Israeli professor, Strumso, makes the point that the Rambab, she sees the Rambab as being influenced by the Almohads. I mean, until he was 25 years old, almost, he's living among all these Muslims, which are, oh, you wouldn't believe this, we'll kill you. So some of that crept into him. It's an interesting theory. Uh, it's an interesting book of interesting theory. But perhaps, perhaps not. The apodicticity was a turnoff to many, as we shall see, because the Ram was always speaking in such, you know, absolutely certain terms. But things were about to change. The publication of the Mishnah Torah marked a turning point in the life of Maimonides. Important life changes, both physical and intellectual, were about to kick in. I had planned to cover it tonight, but look at the hour. This is not going to happen. So stay tuned. For next time, and with that, I bid you a good night. Holy cow.